This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice indeed and be glad. Grace to you and peace on this Easter morning. To you who are physically with us and to those of you who are live streaming with us this morning, a very, very warm welcome to worship. I wish to thank our greeters and our scripture reader and our communion preparers and servers and also our Sunday school teachers who are here this morning. And a note to all of the children who are here, during the singing of our next hymn, which is coming right up, I invite you to make your way down to this corner at the front. You'll go with your teachers for a time together, and then you'll come back in to join us all for communion, okay? Finally, to our loft full of musicians for your gifts and ministry this morning, thank you as always. Together, let us sing our hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Life-giving God, joining with angels and archangels, 
and with the chorus that is rising throughout all the earth, we rejoice. You take our endings and you make new beginnings. You surprise and astound us in places where we expect you would be absent. You challenge us to reconsider what is possible. Continue to make with us your new creation and by your grace rise in us, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke from the 24th chapter. Let us listen for a word from God. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their, bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the human one must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered Jesus' words, and returning from the tomb, they told all to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the disciples. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and apostles did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. Amen.
Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be faithful to your holy word, O Holy One. Amen. Our country was so beautiful, she says. Now it lies in ruins devastated by all the fighting. Jasminka is speaking of her homeland and images that until now have only entered my world by television screen or printed page become more vivid. Samir, her seven-year-old child, works on a picture puzzle at a card table not far from the dining room table at which we are seated. As he quietly moves puzzle pieces round looking for a match, Sladzen, Jasminka's husband, struggles to find words with which to express himself in English. He turns often to his 14-year-old teenager, Elmir, to translate for him. The light-hearted chatter around the dining room table earlier that evening, rave reviews about the meal our Minnesotan-born hostess has prepared and the delicious sweetbread that Jasminka has baked and brought, has given way to solemn conversation. Stretches of silence have replaced the quiet laughter, interrupted only by the heart-rending stories of this Bosnian family's experience in the years prior. Captive in their own home in Mostar, hiding in the home of a stranger, eating and sleeping and waking, spending their days and nights in a basement, the light of day not theirs to see, the sounds of war filling the darkness, escaping with only the clothes they wear and trying to make home with a thousand others in a Turkish refugee camp. They are filled with sorrow as they remember their city, once known for its stunning beauty. They are haunted, not knowing where their family and friends are now and whether they are safe. And their faces are lined with pain and anguish and disillusionment and grief. And as they speak, I am deeply moved by their presence. They are so vulnerable and yet so strong. They are wounded by their past, yet determined to make for themselves a future. They are longing to be reunited with loved ones, yet open to new relationships with people here in Minneapolis. They are courageous and hopeful and persistent. They will not be defeated despite all they have been through. And in their presence, I am reminded of their people back home and of a story that some of you may also recall, for it is a story of their people that appeared around the world in its day. It is New Year's Eve. The surviving members of the Sarajevo Philharmonic gather together. There are 20 empty 
chairs, vestiges of the war years and the lives that those years have claimed. But this night, the empty chairs are filled with guest musicians, musicians who have traveled from far and wide to join the symphony for this one unprecedented performance. The journalist who covers this story writes of the opening moments of that concert. He says, as the concert began with Beethoven's Fifth, it was hard to believe that the Sarajevo Philharmonic played for the first time since the war with electricity to read their music and heat to warm their hands. Cameras and journalists were in abundance, and in the audience around me, he writes, war-weary eyes began to well up with tears. Out of the deadly silence of burned-out homes and cemeteries constructed on what were once green spaces and an Olympic stadium. Out of the silence of frightened, wordless children playing on sandbags near NATO tanks on Sniper Alley, the sounds of the symphony rang out. The conductor's baton was raised, and deep breaths were taken, and bows were lifted, and flutes, and oboes, and clarinets, and bassoons, and horns, and trumpets, and timpani, and piccolo, and trombones, and a contrabassoon, all joining together, courageously filled with hope, refusing to suffer defeat a magnificent celebration of life. On this Easter morn, it is to this kind of witness to life that I invite us to turn in celebration and joy. It is to courage and to hope, and to the refusal to be defeated at the hands of all kinds of inflicted suffering and death, to which the living Christ calls us in Luke's sacred story of the resurrection. The events of Jesus' last days as we relive them each year during Holy Week, stir within us the memories of his suffering and of the suffering of all who knew him and loved him and lost him. His mother, his women friends and companions, his disciple, those who were poor and those who are orphaned, those who are old, those who live on the margins. Who will befriend us after he's gone? Who will defend us after his death? Who will eat with us and laugh with us and weep tears with us and sustain us? when he is no more. Questions undoubtedly uttered in the face of fear and uncertainty. And questions ultimately answered in the days and the weeks that followed as those who mourned Jesus' absence began to experience his presence alive and rising in their midst. His was the presence that comforted them in their grief. 
His was the presence that guided them in their decision making. His was the presence that empowered them to persevere toward a just and peaceful world, the new creation. His was the presence that instilled within them beyond a shadow of a doubt the faith that they needed to continue his subversive teachings and his prophetic preaching even in the wake of the persecution by the authorities of his day. And his was the presence that opened the way to the Spirit at Pentecost, which gave birth to the early church, a band of trembling and true folks, an ordinary, motley crew, just like us, who were compelled to bear witness to life, to life for all people, no matter what the cost, even on to death. At a time in history when followers of Jesus were persecuted, they refused to be silenced. And instead, they made noise and all kinds of it. They made music. And theirs, too, was a symphony of resurrection. Easter is about life, resurrection life. Easter is about living, resurrection living. It is, I think, about renewing our covenant to be in this world as people of courage and as people of hope, trusting that we are never alone, that the presence of the Holy One continues to rise among us. It is, I think, about being in the world as passionate resistors to injustice and oppression and honestly all kinds of evil. It is about being in the world as faithful witnesses to the promise of the transformation of a world gone awry. Easter is about shouting a firm and faithful yes to life into the silence of inflicted suffering and death. It is about lifting the instruments that are our lives from their worn and weary cases and tuning them again and listening to each other. It is about practicing melodies once at our fingertips yet long forgotten and joining together to create a symphony of resurrection that will resound in our streets and our neighborhoods and our town, and by God's grace, perhaps even beyond. To create such a symphony we need to commit over and again to the discipline of daily practice. And each of us must participate if life is to triumph. To what are we as a community of faith being called to help ease the burden of homelessness in our own community? To what are we as a community of faith being called to care for creation and to repair the gaping wounds in our earth and our air and the sky? To what are we as a community of faith being called to create safety and welcome for gender non-conforming children and youth in our neighborhoods? 
To what are we as a community of faith being called so that philharmonics in Ukraine and Gaza and symphonies in Russia and Israel and drumming circles here in Nova Scotia do not have empty chairs or missing people who are essential to the harmony of life in its great fullness. Resurrection life. Resurrection living is not always easy. It can be costly, it can be demanding, it insists of us that we make choices moment by moment about who we will be and about how we will be in this world. Guatemalan theologian, writer, and peace activist Julia Esquivel knows well the kinds of choices that are required of us if we are to confront inflicted suffering and death and to cry out for life. She writes out of the context of the crucifixions that have victimized her country daily for decades. She writes, I will remain with my people the dispossessed, the deceived, the persecuted, the bargained for, with the people who have never been considered human but who keep standing up and surviving and beginning again. I will remain with the ones who have been three times dispossessed, forced off their land the ones who have been chased like deer through forests and jungles. I will remain with the silent people who guard in the intimacy of their hearts the last word. I will remain with the elderly, with the widows and the orphans in the crushed hearts of the weak, God finds strength. Yes, I will remain with my people. On this Easter morn, the words of Julia Esquivel, now herself of blessed memory, invite us and challenge us and call us to resurrection life and to resurrection living. For only when we stand with Jasminka and Simir, with Sladzan and Elmir, only when we sit with the Sarajevo Philharmonic and risk to play once again. Only when we participate in ending homelessness and repairing creation and creating safety for all our children. Only when we live in such a way that our indigenous kin can drum and dance free and proud and unafraid, will a symphony of resurrection burst forth from the silence and the celebration of life be made manifest in all the world. And may the Holy One, the Christ rising among us, fill us and empower us to learn our parts and tune our lives to make music together.
that it may be so. Hallelujah. And amen. Let us continue our Easter worship with the presentation of our morning offerings.
God of great gifts, this Easter morning we give you praise. With resurrection humming in our hearts, our minds are tuned to your sounds of life. We joyfully present these gifts to you, a tangible chorus of thanksgiving, a harmony of hope for your new creation. Amen. At this table, all are welcome. You do not need to be a member of this community of faith or of any community of faith to be welcomed here. For we believe that Christ is the host and has set the table and welcomes us, each one. Let us pray.
holy mystery that is holy love. You are beyond complete knowledge, above perfect description. Creator, Christ, and Spirit, source of life and living word, you are creative and self-giving, generously moving in all the near and distant corners of the universe. Nothing exists that does not find its source in you. Through fear-filled days and aching nights, when the powers of death have done their worst, your love has never deserted us. Even when we turn away from you, you are with us. Your presence never fails us. Your gifts of hope and new life transform us. We praise you for Jesus the Christ rising in our midst, eternal as your love. With the women at the tomb, we raise the song of gladness, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The day of resurrection has come, scattering fear and despair. And so we rejoice with all your people of every time and place, and with the angels and archangels to proclaim the wonder of your holy name. Amen. In this meal, we remember Jesus, his promises, and the price he paid for who he was, and what he said, and how he lived in the world. We remember that on the night before he died, he gathered round table with those closest to him and took the bread as we now take the bread and gave God thanks and broke it. And to his followers he said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Each time you do this, remember me. In the same manner after supper, Jesus took the cup and he gave God thanks, and he said to those gathered with him at table, this is the cup of the new covenant, the cup of blessing, the cup of reconciliation. Each time you drink of this cup, remember me. We do remember we remember Jesus' life of love, his friendship, his teaching, and his dying, and his rising again. Holy mystery, God the Spirit, bless this bread and cup that in the sharing of these simple gifts, we may taste and see your goodness now and forevermore. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all is now ready.
the bread of life, food for your journey.
The cup of the new covenant, that none need thirst. Let us join together in our unison prayer. Thank you, O oh God, for this feast of life. We are fed by your love. We are strengthened by your grace. Send us forth into this world to live your way and proclaim your joy. Empower us to feed as we have been fed, to forgive as we have been forgiven, and to love as we have been loved. Amen. Friends, as we begin our week ahead, we'd like to share just a few brief notes of the upcoming activities in the life and work of our congregation. First of all, it is concert season upon us officially again. I believe we have seven concerts between the 1st of April and the end of June, and uh, more details about those will be coming out in the coming days. Note that the Songwriters Circle will be held on April 21st, and the Cantabile Singing Her Song concert will be held on April the 27th. Those are the first two with details to come. Uh, on behalf of the search committee and in accordance with United Church Polity, I'd like to share with you this following announcement. The search committee of First United has completed its work and will present its recommendations for the position of word, sacrament, and spiritual formation at a special meeting of the council and congregation immediately following worship one week from today, Sunday, April the 7th. The council and the congregation will vote on the search committee's recommendations at that time. Please plan to attend this meeting to cast your vote with thanks. Last but not least, at the conclusion of our time together today, we will be singing the Hallelujah Chorus. And if you feel so inclined, I would, in, I would love to have a choir loft filled with singers. So anyone who wishes to do so is welcome to come up during the singing of our next hymn. Our sopranos are there wave for us. Our altos are there, our tenors are there, our basses are there, and if you don't know where to sing, just come on up and we'll find a place for you. And we have some copies of the music if you didn't bring your own. Thanks. I have three announcements to make. The first is a reminder if you'd like to join Honora for morning meditation this coming Thursday at 10.30, please sign up with Tracy in the office by Tuesday. Also, two weeks from this morning, we will be welcoming the Right Reverend Dr. Carmen Lansdowne, who will be our guest preacher here that morning, 
Carmen is the first Indigenous woman to be moderator of the United Church of Canada. And so it is a great privilege that she will be with us. We will also be welcoming our neighboring congregations uh, from other United Churches and some folks from the community. So we hope that you'll be with us here two weeks from today on April 14th. And finally, as many of you know, a beloved member of this congregation, Dorothy Cruikshank, died this past week. The funeral service for Dorothy will be held at Colchester Community Funeral Home tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock. And I ask that our love and prayers be with all those who are feeling Dorothy's death most keenly. As a people of the resurrection, let us continue to worship with our closing hymn. Let us go forth into the world with a daring and a tender love, for the world is waiting. Let us go in peace, and may the love of God in the communion of the Spirit and the grace of the Christ rising among us go with us on our way. Amen.